Good morning. Thank you. I appreciate that. My wife is on the road back from Alabama, and she cannot tease me about being a year older. This is a good day for her every year because she's four months older than I am. So for those four months, she, I let her know she's older than I am. <laughs> it was really good like when decades change. Well, you're in your 40s, but I'm in my 30s, you know, things like that. Um, can't wait till 50 comes around. That's going to be great. So she's not with me today, and that's probably, that's probably good because she always makes up for it on this day. It is great to be here and, and to be able to share with you in our month of families. We do this every year. This is the third year that Daniel has planned for us to talk and to focus in all of our Bible classes, in all of our, our sermons around the general topic of families. And this morning we're going to examine a topic that is tied in with what was read for us just a few moments ago. Drink from your own cistern and enjoy the wife of your youth. Now that phrase, wife of your youth, is powerfully meaningful to me. Because I, I re never really noticed that passage when as a young minister, as a young preacher right out of school, I had only been at our first congregation at the age of 22 for one month. And they gave, had to give me an entire month off because we thought my mom was going to die. She had had horrendous pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis at the age of 40, goodness, my mom is, was 20 when she had me, I was 20, she was 42 years old, four years younger than I am today. And she had acute pancreatitis, and when she went into the hospital in Fresno, California, there had been a gang war that night in Fresno, and there were a lot of gunshot wounds, and they were super busy in the emergency room, and the doctor misdiagnosed her. And sent her home thinking it was bad indigestion. So her body in essence digested itself for the course of about eight more hours until my dad took her back. By that time, it was too late. And my mom got massive internal infection. She bloated out. I'm getting to a point with all this, I promise. But she bloated out to the size of a nine-month pregnant woman. And my mom weighed about 120 pounds at that time. And if you touch her stomach, it was, felt like it would burn your hand. It was so hot with infection. About two weeks into this deal, and she was in intensive care 72 days. But about two weeks into this thing, the doctor, the surgeon, the top surgeon they had, he said, well, Mr. Williams, he said, we've got to go in there and get out all that infection. He says, but I, I'm looking at the x-rays and the ultrasounds and he says, there's so much damaged tissue in there. I don't know what's organ and what's damaged tissue. I don't know what to do. He said, so I've got to go in and try. He said, and my dad asked him in front of us kids, what do you think her chances are? He said, I, he said I, I'm an honest man, Mr. Williams. So I'd like to tell you better, but I think 3 to 5%. Well, my mom lived through that surgery, but because of the nature of that kind of Infection, they had to leave her open and she had to heal naturally, no stitches. That was horrible. She still has a scar as thick as the band on your shirt. I say all of this because the night before my mom was going into that surgery where the surgeon said 3 to 5%, that means she's not making it through that surgery. I was upset. It was about one in the morning, and my dad and I were sitting there in that hospital room together, and I was upset. And I said, Dad, this isn't fair. Why is God letting this happen? Same thing I've heard other people say about things. Why is God letting this happen to our family? Daddy, you've been faithful and a preacher all your life. I'm trying to preach now, and, and my, Melanie's husband at the time, my sister's husband was a preacher, and, and I said, look, at, we, we give our whole life to the Lord. Why would, he do, why would he allow this to happen? 
my dad turned over and he said, stop. Stop it. He said, we serve God and his will is what matters. And we got down on our knees and my daddy said a prayer. And he wept and I wept and it was a simple prayer. It was one of the shortest prayers. My dad's kind of wordy. It's one of the shortest prayers I've ever heard him pray that night thinking his darling was not going to make it through the next day. And he used that phrase, Lord, she's the wife of my youth. She's the wife of my youth. And he said it over and over. Please, save her. Please. And then he closed with, but thy will be done. I learned something powerful that night about faith. But I learned something equally powerful that night about love. And so when I read that text, drink from your own cistern. Adore the wife of your youth. That's what comes to my mind. And now, all those years from that day till now, having witnessed my dad living out that prayer, serving her every day, taking care of her, and it has been hard because she's never been the same. My mom's out of bed about two hours a week. And he was still a young man. But through all that time, serving and sacrificing and loving. It is a powerful image of what marriage really is. So with this text as a background, I want us to turn to probably the longest and most extensive passage in the New Testament about marriage, which would be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Because when we consider the idea of marriage in our current context, both within the church and in the world at large, what can be said about it? Well, marriage has been abused and it's been abandoned. It's been nullified and it's been redefined. We live in a country where 50% plus of marriages end in divorce and the divorce rate is higher among religious people because at least worldly people are catching on and they're not getting married. And you might say, well, that's not good. They're living together. They're so forth and so on. I'm not sure. I struggle because I almost think it might be better that they're doing that in their wickedness, in their ungodliness because at least it's not a mockery to marriage. You understand? Because when people just get married and their vows say, Till we, for as long as we both shall love each other. It's, I'm not kidding. That's a common marriage vow now. To love, honor, cherish for as long as we both shall love each other. It spits on marriage. It spits on covenant. So you know what? I would rather worldly people just live with each other than make a mockery of a sacred vow. You look at that in the world and you say, what, what, where's it, how has it come to this? What has happened to God's plan for marriage? I remember in a paper I saw a comic strip several years ago and it had a couple fellas and they were talking and one's engaged and he says, I'm getting kind of scared. The day's getting close. And the other guy says, yeah, it's a big commitment. Seven or eight years can be a long time. And unfortunately, that's how, that's how people think. If this doesn't work, it's, I'm not stuck in it. And how can we even call it marriage? And so we live in a time where 
We don't live in a world in which people will sit in a hospital room and say, no matter what, if it means I have to serve, if it means I have to deal with the emotions, and I have to deal with the sickness, and I have to deal with the consequences, it, it doesn't matter. All I want is to be able to live out my covenant. Well, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul addresses marriage. And he tells us some powerful things through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. We start in verse 1 through 5 and it says, Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except for consent for a time, that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, in this, Paul starts off and it almost seems as if he's implying that it's better, that marriage is kind of a second-rate state of being. That it's better not to be married. Well, you understand, this has to be contextually placed within the fact that he mentions the Corinthians had communicated with him, and he's communicated with them because it says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So, he's saying, in your particular situation, and folks, you get that, right? If you might be killed for being a Christian and your spouse might be killed for being married to a Christian, it might be in that particular circumstance that it would be a mercy to not get married. Everybody get that? Or if there would be excessive persecution. Or if there would be, there are certain circumstances. But what we must not misunderstand Paul to say is that in some way, oh, it's a better state of being just in general to be by yourself. It's okay. It's not sinful to be by yourself. But we have to remember that God is the author of marriage. And in the beginning, God said this. It is not good for man to be alone. Therefore, I will make a helper for him. Okay, that is God's view of the best state of living, of being. Not the only acceptable state of being. But we mustn't un misunderstand Paul to be somehow settling for marriage, only for those who are so burnt up with lust or desire that they have to have it in order to barely make it through the gates of paradise. No. He's talking about their current situation. But it does tell us something. It tells us that marriage must be a give, give circumstance. So many marriages are built upon a concept of fairness. Well, covenants are not built upon fairness. Contracts are built upon fairness. In business, you make a contract that is equally acceptable and agreeable to both parties. And that contract spells out how this party will benefit from the arrangement and how this party will benefit from the arrangement. Covenants are not that way. And if you want evidence, realize this. Abraham made a covenant with God. Abraham, what did Abraham get out of that? A lot. What did God get out of it? Abraham. Oh, wow. Wow. God made a covenant with you when you entered into that watery grave and you died unto yourself. There was blood that was shed and that is what's required to seal a covenant. What did you get out of it? Let me tell you what I got out of it. Forgiveness and mercy and love and joy and hope and a future that I did not deserve. What did God get out of it? He got me. 
Guess who got the better end of that deal? You understand my point? Contracts are equal agreements. Covenants are not. Covenants are committed. Lifetime. Eternal promises. That are built upon conviction. Not upon benefit. And they're given totally for the benefit of the one that you make covenant with. Here's why it's such an unfair deal for God. Because when we both made that covenant, when I went down into that watery grave, I made a covenant with him that I would be faithful to him, that I would be pure and keep myself righteous for him. And do you know what? I haven't. Oh, I keep trying, you know. Whenever I fail, I get back up and I try again. But here's the thing. The very thing I promised in that covenant, I have broken and broken and broken and broken. Anybody else? Here's, but here's the other side of that. He made some promises too. How many did he break? Think about it. How many promises has he broken to me? None. Covenant is not about give and take. Covenant's just about give. Covenant's not just that, well, I'll do my fair share and she'll do her fair share. No, no, no. This is describing as he says, let, let the wife does not have authority over her own body, but her husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You see, he's describing a circumstance where you're not give and take, you're give and give. And when you're empty and you don't have anything else to give, you just give whatever's left. And if that doesn't sound fair to you, and you're like, well, who would want it? Then don't get married. Let's just be honest. Let's get real. If you don't give yourself completely, then it's not a covenant. And it's mockery to call it a marriage. That's what it is. You know, Ephesians 5, through 25, we know that text. Wives, submit to your husbands in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. It doesn't describe a 50-50. It describes a 100-100 where both parts give everything, everything of who they are. Just imagine, this is one of my daddy's old illustrations. And so I think he's an authority on this. So I'll quote him. He said, my whole goal in being a spouse is that my wife wears an invisible bucket around her neck. We all have invisible buckets around our neck. And in that bucket is where we put, we deposit love and self-esteem and praise, all the good things in life. But the problem is, is that every person, every human being has holes in the bottom of their bucket, right? And what we typically do, what worldly people do, is they take their ladle and they reach into their partner's bucket and try to move to their own bucket. Don't people do this? I mean, trying to... Give me what will fill me up. And then their partner has got their ladle, and you know, they're in a ladle battle here. When what the Lord says to do is to take your bucket, go over to her bucket and take all your love and all your self esteem and all your 
personal pride and all those things that are in your bucket and pour your bucket into hers. That's what the scriptures, that's what Paul is trying to communicate. That marriage is that covenant that is give and give and give. That's what it's supposed to be. And, and what, a, what a beautiful picture that is. It's like the pickle family. There was a couple who were married for 50 plus years. And everybody just thought they had the greatest marriage. Because they were those, that special couple that just have a lot in common, you know. Particularly pickles. The husband, he, by all appearances, loved to grow cucumbers. I mean, he'd spend all winter and he'd look through the seed catalogs just to get the right cucumbers. And I mean, as soon as spring, as soon as the last thaw was gone, he was working out there. He was tending that plot, best fertilizer, everything he could so he could grow those cucumbers. And his wife, by all appearances, she loved to can pickles. And so she'd spend all winter researching new recipes to get it just right, to, to make those pickles. And so, I mean, everybody who came to their house, and you know, in, at church, at the end of the summer, everybody was going home with jars of pickles. I mean, you know those folks, right? Sometimes they're squash people, sometimes they're, you know, tomato people, or, or you know, maybe raccoon people, or uh, whatever. <laughs> but, they, but they'd send you home with something, you know? Well, they were pickle people. And they're so happy about their pickles. Well, the husband died. And the children were all gathered around. And one of the sons said, you know, Mama, we know Daddy would want us to do this. So I haven't talked to the others about it yet. But come spring, we're going to make, we're going to get your garden ready. And we're going to plant those cucumbers. Just like Daddy would want us to. To which the mother replied, oh, that's not necessary, honey. She said, I don't really like pickles very much. But your daddy liked to grow cucumbers so much. And I just wanted him to be happy. And it really bothered their daughter. Because just about a year before that, she'd been spending time with her dad and he had told her, he really didn't like growing cucumbers very much. <laughs> but he just loved that their mama liked making pickles so much. Give to be married, to be in covenant, is to give. And you know what? I really do get the better end. Even Lenora gets the better end, believe it or not. Because compared to this covenant with God, she gives me a hundred times more than I'll ever faithfully give him. And I give her a hundred times more than any of us will ever faithfully give him. We've not been treated unfairly. We've been given a beautiful blessing, the blessing of covenant marriage. Paul goes on in the text and he says in verses 6 through 9, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment, for I wish that all men were as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain even as I, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Again, this is in the exact context of their circumstance. But he says, in essence, marriage, this marriage covenant is a safe haven from the world. You realize God gave us marriage so we can endure this world where every billboard is lewd. And where every, every television show has, has indecency. And every magazine has ads that you're like, wow. And you try to enjoy time this summer and go to the beach with your family. And you're like, you know. 
And you say, well, how can we survive in a world like this? Because God gave us a partner. And we were not, we're not going to get graphic. We're not going to get insensitive. But this text is pretty clear, right? That married people are there to, for each other as a safety blanket against the lust and immorality of this world. And I'll tell you that I believe Christians have done a disservice to the word of God and a dishonor to marriage when they have acted in regard to sexuality and intimacy as if it is, you know, sometimes we get so prim and proper that we almost act as if the Puritans, how they acted, that it's just a, a exercise for procreation and that it's bad, bad, bad. In the wrong context, it's immoral and it's ungodly. But in the right context, it is ordained by God and holy and pure. And that's what the Bible says. Not the preacher. And so that part of a marriage is sacred and holy and specifically in this passage on four verses specifically instructed. And so how dare we ever, can you imagine if I get irritated at Allie and I hold him back something that's ordained by God, if I say to him, Allie, you keep, you keep feeding me raccoon and I'm going to, you know, I don't know, but Allie, you keep doing that, I'm, gonna, you can't, I'm not going to let you have grace. I'm not going to let you have it. Or how about, well, I'm not going to fellowship you. I'm not going to give you my fellowship. If you don't act this way, what would you say to me if I acted that way? Shame on me. But what about if there are other things that are specifically ordained by God, yet Christian people hold it from another over their head for control? Do I have to get more clear? Everybody understand? That's sinful. Because this is a relationship in marriage. Well, we're not worried about taking. It's about giving and giving and giving. Which leads us to verses 10 through 16. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest say, I, say, rest I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who he does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And if a woman who is a husband who does not believe, he, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children will be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether or not you will save your husband? And how do you know, O husband, whether or not you will save your wife? Well, countless volumes have been written on this section of Scripture in regard to marriage, particularly in regard to divorce and what it means. And I'm just going to be very, very clear in that I think sometimes when that's our purpose of looking at this passage, we miss the point of this passage. Because whatever is meant by these words that are difficult to cipher in the context of not under bondage or unbelievers or all that all of this means... His point is brought out in verse 16. For how do you not know, a wife, whether you will save your husband? Or husband, if you will save your wife. The point here is not to give someone an excuse to get out. Paul's very idea here is to say that no marriage is supposed to be forever. It's supposed to be something that is a covenant unbreakable. That's why he says there and concludes, he says, yeah, but even if you're married to an unbeliever, think what you can do through that powerful covenant. And in the first few verses, he says to the married, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. A husband is not to divorce his wife. 
You see, he says, no, marriage is intended by God that no man can separate. You see, Paul doesn't see marriage as a toss, take and toss situation. And as Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 19, if any man divorces his wife and marries another for a cause other than adultery, he commits adultery. And in that, Jesus is trying to specify the importance that God, and he'll even refer back to the beginning, that what God has brought together, let no man put asunder. And Paul is reaffirming the same thing through this language. The Lord says not I, I say not the Lord. He's referring back to this same concept that Jesus is saying and that God the Father was saying with the very first man and woman that marriage is meant to be permanent. It's meant to be permanent. I think it's a good thing that the world is getting married less. Because they don't know what marriage is. And I think, now I'm not in any way espousing immorality, you understand that. So just don't make that assumption. But I think it might be better if some Christians just chose not to be married. And lived celibate. But chose not to be married. When we have a 50% divorce rate. Because clearly, some of us do not know what a covenant is. A covenant is to cry in a hospital room at one in the morning and pray, Lord, please, 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 Save the wife of my youth. It's a decision to give and to give and to give until you can't give no more and then to give again. This morning if you have the desire to make any change in your life, the need to make any change in your life, maybe even in regard to this. Maybe you need to say to your husband or to your wife, huh? I'm going to give more. I'm going to give. I'm going to stop trying to ladle from your bucket to mine. I'm just going to care about what's going in yours. Whatever your need today, don't delay. Come right now as we stand and as we sing.